let's take a look at some stomach anatomy. Now, when you look at these openings of the stomach, there's one at the very beginning, one at the very end. So right where the esophagus meets your stomach, where you got this lower esophageal sphincter, you have this gastroesophageal region, also called the cardiac region. And it's called that because the apex of the heart lies very close to where the esophagus and the stomach meet. That is why sometimes when a person has bad heartburn, they might think they're having a mild heart attack. Sometimes they might have a mild heart attack and think they're just having bad heartburn. Because those structures are close to each other, those pains are sometimes mistaken. But if you go to the very end of the stomach, right, at the beginnings where we have that esophagus meeting the stomach with that lower esophageal sphincter, but at the end of the stomach, you got this pyloric region with another circular muscle called the pyloric sphincter. So this muscle will stay closed to keep material in the stomach, but when it, when it relaxes and opens, it'll let material move into the duodenum, <clears throat> which is the first part of the small intestine. So you got back at, towards the beginning of the stomach, that cardiac region, where again, the apex of the heart is close to it. You have the fundus, the very broad, wide, superior part of the stomach, the only part of the stomach that's above that esophagus in any way. The body's the main part of any structure. If you look to the inside of the body of the stomach, you'll see all these rugi, these wrinkles or folds that allow for expansion. That way we can feel a lot of food in our stomach. And the stomach is where we have another place in the body where we've got baroreceptors. Again, barrow or pressure or stretch receptors can detect that stretching of the stomach. As those rugi unfold and you fill the stomach with food, that's how you can feel when you're full there. And then again, you get to the end of the stomach, to that pyloric region. You get to that andrum, the last third of the stomach's a little bit narrowed as you go towards this pyloric sphincter right there at the very end of it before you get to the duodenum. The stomach also has a couple of curvatures associated with it. On the top superior part of the stomach is the lesser, and then there's the larger one on the inferior part of the stomach called the greater, and then there's those two sphincter muscles we mentioned before, right? Cardiac, that's that lower esophageal right there where the stomach starts, and the pyloric at the very end of the stomach where it meets the duodenum. The layers are tunics of the GI tract we probably mentioned before. We'll look at them again. The serosa or visceral peritoneum is the superficial outer layer. So if you're looking at the outside surface, the stomach, intestine, or whatever, that's the serosa. You got that muscular layer, lots of muscle in there. You got the submucosa, which is deeper, lots of glands and lots of lymphatic nodules in that region. And then, of course, to the very inside is the mucosal layer, where you got the mucous membrane. Look at the cells of all these gastric glands. Look at these different cell types. Now, the first two here are just making the mucus. There's some on the inner lining of the stomach and also in all these little necks, these ducts of these glands. Again, you've got more mucus lining the inside of your stomach than any other place. That way, those acids and enzymes don't damage the epithelial cells which line the stomach wall. But you also have these parietal cells making the hydrochloric acid. We mentioned before, it's not there for digestion. It kills the bacteria and activates the enzymes, which will do some digestion in the stomach. There's actually not that much occurs there. But the parietal cells also release intrinsic factors. This is needed for the absorption of B12. Now, that is not needed for energy production, as you may have heard of before. That is needed for DNA production. If you want to make a cell, you got to make a nucleus. That means you got to make DNA. That's where this intrinsic factor gets important. You got these chief cells putting out a chemical, pepsinogen. This enzyme here will break down proteins. And some endocrine cells putting out hormones like somatostatin that inhibits the gastrin and insulin secretion. So look at some of these secretions of the stomach. Remember the chyme or chyme, however you want to pronounce it, it's what you call the food. After the stomach has added its secretions and mixed it around for a little while, again, lots of mixing waves in the stomach, moving stuff around. You got the mucus, again, very thick layer. It's very sticky, so it sticks to the inner wall of the stomach. And since it's very alkaline, these negatively charged proteins and other materials will neutralize the positive hydrogen in the acids. You need that to protect the inner wall of the stomach. There again is the intrinsic factor released by the parietal cells. Again, you need that for the absorption of the B12 for the DNA synthesis. There's the hydrochloric acid 
killing the bacteria and activating some enzymes. And they also mentioned pepsinogen around in here, needed for breaking down some of these protein chemical bonds called covalent chemical bonds. There's also three phases of gastric secretions. Now, the first two will cause the stomach to release more of its secretions, and the last one will inhibit it. So with the cephalic phase, that's really all about your brain. Just seeing, smelling, even thinking of food can actually start a small amount of secretions in the stomach. Be a very small amount, but think about when you show maybe your dog something he wants to eat, you can see starts starts to salivate. So you can see where that would start secretions in the digestive system. But then there's the gastric phase. This occurs once food gets to the stomach. And when you start to put enough food in that stomach to unfold those rouges, you, you get that stretching or distension, that's when most all the enzymes in the stomach will be released at that time. So this will be carried by the vagus nerve, one of your cranial nerves up to the medulla oblongata, and add to those secretions. Now, after you got the stomach releasing all these secretions and they all do their job, then the material is going to be moved out of the stomach and into the small intestine. So whenever that food material goes into the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine, little pH receptors will detect all that hydrogen coming from the stomach. That will cause the release of chemicals, hormones like secretin and cholecystokinin, and these will decrease gastric secretions. And the medulla oblongata will work right along with them and inhibit the stomach secretions too. Stomach movements, lots of movement. Your stomach and your intestines are mostly smooth muscle. So think of your stomach as a big mixing chamber. Sort of like with your washing machine, you put clothes in it, but with the stomach, you put food in it. And then think about what you do with that washing machine. You add a lot of water and then some chemicals. Same general idea with the stomach. You're gonna put the food in there, water and enzymes, and that stomach's gonna slosh it and move it around. That's all those mixing waves. It's going to take the larger, more solid particles and push them up towards the fundus, which is that broad top part of the stomach. And then the smaller, more liquid materials down towards the end of the stomach, towards that pyloric region. So after the stomach is satisfied that the food material is pretty much as small and liquid as it's going to get, you'll have these peristaltic waves moving them through that pyloric sphincter into the duodenum and into the small intestine. So there's our pictures we have before of all these structures. You can look at those before right there.